Anyway, over to Maria. I think, are we ready to go, Thamson? Yeah, we're ready, ready to go, Maria. Thank you for taking the time out. We really appreciate it. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, thank you for reminding me of that um, hugely interesting uh, conference in Manchester. And uh, you were quite right. Uh, the, um, the climate and nature emergency or uh, the climate trauma, as you just suggested, is something that has um, been, uh, is something we've been working on um, a great deal within the UK museums, but especially at Tate. But given um, the focus in your conference around uh, exploring ideas of the inclusive or expanded uh, museum, what I'm going to talk to everyone about today are um, ideas around changing the histories and changing audiences as we think about being a museum in the 21st century and um, working towards as I always like to think, uh, being an inclusive museum, knowing it will always be uh, um, um, a work in evolution. Um, so uh, it's lovely to speak to you today. I'm sorry I can't be with you all um, in your lecture hall in Vancouver, but um, I am in the midst of the opening of a very, very busy season here at Tate Modern and, and Tate Britain. And um was not able to, to get away. Can I just check that um, all things are working properly technically? Can you see um, my opening screen, which has my title and name and the image of um, Shyla Berman's work on the outside of Tate Britain? Yes. Fantastic, I shall kick off then. Um, so um, knowing that you would be um, a, a varied audience um, and knowing also that you have the web pages and a reasonable introduction um, to me, I nonetheless wanted to begin with just a brief overview of uh, Tate and the work that we now do here in the UK and also across the world. So my role is as, is as director of the four Tates. Um, the institution is now, it wasn't always, is now made up of four museums in four different locations in the UK. The first ever Tate Gallery, the one that I first got to know, um, is the one you can see in the this image, although it, it doesn't always look um, this uh, uh, neon fantastic. Um, it was created as Tate Gallery. It's now known as Tate Britain. It opened in 1897 in the heart of Victorian England, at the behest of a group of powerful men who were really wanting to flex their cultural muscles. As the painter James Oric declared in the Times in March 1890, he said, a wealthy country like ours ought to be able to stop the mouths of foreign critics with a representative and choice collection. The time has come for the creation of a great British gallery. And one was indeed created and whilst 126 years later, um, the idea that it would have been strange to have a gallery of British art um, uh, is, um, is not something that um, we would expect, we are nonetheless still rather preoccupied with what a representative and choice collection serving a public might mean um, um, in the very uh, different landscape we now operate in. And I shall come back to that towards the end of my talk. That great British gallery, as Tate, stood as the only one until the 1980s, when uh, a new vision for the organisation came, came about, spurred on by a determination to correct, connect to a broader public. So a Tate of the North was made in Liverpool, um, I arrived in 1988 uh, to Tate Liverpool opening and um, for the first time as an adult, I was able to uh, really get to know uh, an internationally minded gallery and um, driven by a fantastic collection. The aspiration for Tate Liverpool was always one of connection and inclusion. It was about taking art away from the elite confines of the capital city to reach a much um, wider audience across the UK. It was situated, you'll see here, on Liverpool's uh, historic docks, connecting to that global history and circulation 
of trade, um, connecting us from the very beginning to the histories of um, uh, slave trading and um, enslaved peoples. Um, and it uh, has functioned for many decades now as a real beacon for modern and contemporary art in the north of England. A few years later, this state was in St. Ives. Um, it looks out across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, based in a Cornish town which was made famous by the presence of the artist Barbara Hepworth, her partner Ben Nicholson, and the many other British artists who gathered in this small town, appreciative of the light and the freedom that this space gave them. Both of these regional galleries were galvanized by, as I said, a desire for wider connection with the general public across the UK and a greater inclusivity and access to the national collection. Then perhaps now the best known and most influential of Tate's was created in 2000. Tate Modern opened in a former power station overlooking the River Thames. I think for many of you, it will need no introduction. It has become one of the most important and influential modern art galleries in the world, it has welcomed over 100 million visitors since it was opened. The vast industrial tanks that once held the fuel that generated electricity for a large chunk of London now showcase live art, performance and film. It was a world first then and it has helped reshape what we think of as the art historical canon and the global ecology of art. After consistently welcoming nearly 5 million visitors a year uh, in its first decades, Tate Modern itself was expanded. You can see the, um, uh, the, the hexagonal light building uh, towards the back of Tate Modern uh, when in 2016, the Blavatnik building was created to give us space to display an expanding transnational collection of modern and contemporary art. So today, um, after being founded um, in the Age of Empire in the late 19th century, Tate um, is in the 21st century, a world leading collection made up of just around 80,000 works, which are loaned nationally and internationally as well as being used by us. It has still the national collection of British art from 1500 to the present day, but it also holds a genuinely global and transnational modern and contemporary art collection. Our mission is to collect works of the highest quality that reflect the art of the past and the present as we see and understand it today. And Tate is in constant motion, like most museums. Driven by a wish to make our collection and our programmes more diverse, more adventurous, more inclusive to the widest spectrum of artistic practice, as well as the widest spectrum of audiences. We're determined that the days of anyone arriving at the grand porticoed um, Tate Britain facade and um, be contemplating the steps that ascend um, into the gallery and feeling that that was too difficult a threshold to cross, that feeling that perhaps this gallery is not for me, um, Lee, um, lie firmly behind us. And we pride ourselves on being a gallery this was Tate Modern last summer that welcomes people of all ages, all um, uh, walks of life and um, all um, ideas. This is allowing us to connect to a much wider and more diverse public coming through our doors, more now than at any point in our history. But there is still very significant work to be done. And um, as we uh, strive to be more representative of the UK population. Uh, we know the work is to build a collection and build a programme and build stories that um, tell a richer and more diverse story. It is the case, as many of you will know, that most galleries and museums do not reflect the demographics of the cities or the towns they find themselves in. What we have done for um, um, in our vision and in our objectives at Tate is to strive to see if we can get close to the makeup of the communities of London, Liverpool, St Ives and indeed the wider UK. 
And then through our international programs, and most especially through our digital reach, start to reflect the global ecology of the art world, as well as connect to people and communities across the world. I'm now in my sixth year at Tate, having joined from a role at the Whitworth Art Gallery and Manchester Art Gallery um, up in the north of England. Um, and I um, can recognise how much work we have already done around inclusivity across those years. My colleagues across the galleries um, have, re have achieved remarkable things. Recent programming has um, changed the demographics coming to our galleries. So exhibitions like Life Between Islands, which was um, featured at Tate Britain last year um, and shared an extraordinary breadth of Caribbean British art, brought in for the first time an audience that reflected the nearly 50% of Londoners who identify as Black, Asian or minority ethnic. This was one of the works of many in the show and by the terrific artist, Angelica Crosby. Many of the, the works in Life Between Islands connected powerfully to a shared history of communities and exchange um, for British Caribbean people across London and other parts of the UK. This summer, in Tate Modern, um, we hosted our annual Uniqlo Tate Play project. Um, this year, it showed the work of Rashid Areen, which you can see here being constructed and deconstructed by the many visitors to the Turbine Hall. It brought adults and children into the gallery to actively shape this vast sculptural experiment. The result was a much higher number of family visitors uh, over the summer, making up uh, more than 25% of all visitors to Tate Modern. But more than this, it placed a conceptual political work by a senior British Asian artist at the very heart of Tate Modern's building and its programme, which meant that this work was at the heart of London's cultural programming this summer. It provoked joy, engagement, argument and interaction. When we see in the UK and uh, these younger family audiences uh, coming to our galleries, what is reflected is a more diverse audience in class, in ethnic and in racial terms. So during the summer, Uniqlo Take Play saw 33% of visitors identifying as Black, Asian or minority ethnic. We also find that if we shift our programme towards younger generations' cultural and social habits, we see a shift towards a much more diverse audience. So a programme of lates has been um, uh, forged at both Tate Modern. Here you can see a performance in the Turbine Hall with the building absolutely packed with young adults um, and also at Tate Britain, where a, um, a diverse art form programme. Here you see um, uh, music and spoken word performance has allowed a uh, connection with um, a much more diverse and younger uh, London-based audience. So last year, 44% of the audience um, uh, coming to these Tate Britain Lates identified as coming from a minority ethnic background. And if diversifying what and when we programme is one element of a more inclusive mode for museums, then for collections-based institutions like Tate, we also have to ensure that the collection is held for the public in perpetuity in ways that reflect both the variety of the artist ecology in 2023 and the variety of communities that can potentially enjoy what we hold and share. So in the last five years, we focused our collecting strategy on increasing the representation of women artists and uh, black artists and people of color, artists who identify as LGBTQIA+, and artists who identify as disabled, neurodiverse, and over the last three years, bringing for the first time 
collection of works by artists who are from First Nation or Indigenous cultures. Last year, for the first time, we saw a balanced portfolio of acquisitions with a 50-50 gender balance, and a racial and ethnic balance of acquisitions which saw more works by artists of colour coming in than white artists, which will be the case for some years as we have rebalancing work to do in terms of the absences and gaps that exist in collections like ours. What these new acquisitions help us do is tell new stories in our displays, as I will point to in a moment. In a conscious and important way, we're changing the nature of the collection and then using it to drive new stories and new exhibitions building around the works that come into the community. So in a, uh, in a really welcome move that chimes with my own life history, in November this year at Tate Britain, we're opening an exhibition of radical feminist art called Women in Revolt. This slide shows uh, one of the um, extraordinary banners made by women um, who were protesting against nuclear um, arms at Greenham Common in um, the 1980s. Women in Revolt surfaces the work of highly productive, very politically engaged female artists who were working in the UK between 1970 and 1990. In many ways, their work changed the face of British culture and paved the way for future generations of artists and even museum directors. I confess I was taken to Greenham Common and Molesworth, the other um, armament base in the UK, by my uh, radical feminist art and um, aunt, and it made um, a life-changing impact on me. However, as um, a student of art history, when I um, came to study in the um, 80s and 90s, I did not find these women um, artists on the curriculum or in the textbooks on my course. As revolutionary and brilliant as they were, their stories have until very recently been obscured within an art history um, that largely told the story of male artists. Indeed, even in 2023, many of the artists in Women in Revolt have never shown their work in public museums. So the changes that we are making to our collection are also driving change to the, um, the central exhibitions in our programme. And we hope that that will then um, have a positive impact on the visitors that we welcome to this show. Given that I had um, aunts and even great aunts who introduced me to this kind of work, one of the things that's particularly important to me personally uh, with a show like Women in Revolt is that I hope we will see intergenerational engagement and exploration so that many ages of women and men come to enjoy this exhibition. This kind of um, new engagement to collection and exhibitions is also true uh, of a very different show which is on at Tate Modern this summer. And um, this slide shows one of the uh, um, uh, striking images in A World in Common. This is Tate's first exhibition, first major exhibition, exploring contemporary African photography. Again, um, nearly 40% of the works in this exhibition are now in our collection because we have had a sustained uh, collecting focus around um, uh, artists from the African continent. Many of the artists featured in the show um, are having their first institutional presentation and the exhibition speaks to our commitment to sharing a history of art that includes all continents across the globe and most especially draws our attention to the rich diversity of work from the African continent, which has for too long and too often been portrayed in singular and reductive ways. Uh, so the range of artists um, uh, included uh, in um, Osei Bonsu's A World in Common um, uh, move, are drawn from um, uh, the top of North Africa right the way down to the tip of the African continent 
um, and it moves across again many generations of uh, artists and focuses on um, looking at the world through the lens of um, African continent based artists. As we reshape the collection and the programme in different ways, including practices that are drawn from very different cultural and spiritual belief practices, we have to also think about how we change our own institutional modes. This has been especially um, important for us in terms of rethinking ideas of ownership of a collection. And I know that many of you at the conference will be very familiar with the debates um, uh, currently um, raging across um, our sectors around repatriation, rematriation of collections and the work that is required to decenter and decolonize the Eurocentric museum models we inherit. So as we learn to work and think differently with indigenous artists who are coming into Tate's collection, we're also starting to own the art in our collection more inclusively. Our acquisition model at Tate has in the past worked like almost all public museums. We identify and review a piece of work we believe would benefit our collection before it's purchased, purchased or gifted, brought into the collection to stay with us essentially forever. This is, as many artists have pointed out to us, a Western capitalist ownership model that does not sit well with artists whose long care and stewardship of their lands, their belief systems and their culture is based on different non-ownership models. So when we came to look at the work of um, uh, Guatemalan Cachacal artist, Edgar Kalel, we had to think more creatively. This is his work, the echo of an ancient form of knowledge uh, made in 2021. Um, uh, as I said, from a uh, Maya Kachakel background, uh, Edgar has created this work a number of times uh, within uh, European museum settings. Um, it most recently, it has been at Tate Liverpool. Um, and it is both a sculptural piece and an act of ceremony. The rocks that you can see in this work act as altars with fruit and vegetable placed upon each one, after which a ritual is conducted by a member of the Kachakel community, ideally the artist, but in the first iteration of this work, we were all operating under uh, pandemic lockdown restrictions and um, Edgar was not able to travel, but did nonetheless find a member of his community living in London who was able to enact the ceremony for him. And um, the work is not deemed to be complete until that spiritual act has taken place. Kalel's work invokes, um, evokes a connection to his ancestors and pays homage to the local indigenous communities um, that he lives and works within in Guatemala. It is an offering to the artist's ancestors and it's designed to make us consider the complexities of indigenous cultures. In considering the acquisition agreement, uh, we had to create along with the artist, a new model for custodianship. So rather than Tate owning the work, our trustees were asked to become its custodian for 13 years a number of great significance in the Mayan calendar. After which time a new agreement can be made either to renew our custodianship, to pass the work to another institution or to return it to the earth. In making this agreement, we're essentially entering into a knowledge sharing agreement with the Maya Kachakal people. This is a momentous shift for Tate, which proposes a direct line between old world ownership models um, toward um, working with an indigenous community uh, whose culture, lands and language are under threat. Um, similarly, the new has been put in place by Michael Rakovitz's monumental Lamassu. You can see the work here installed on the 4th plinth uh, in London's Trafalgar Square. It's part of his ongoing project, The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist. 
which is an attempt to recreate over 7,000 artifacts missing after the looting of the Iraq Museum in Baghdad in 2003 during the war. Michael offered to gift the work to Tate, um, but also made a request, which we are happy to grant, that this statue should eventually reside in Iraq within a museum that does not yet exist. And um, so this work will migrate from Western to Iraqi institutions, acknowledging the shift and evolution of the contemporary Iraqi situation. This is essentially, therefore, a diasporic artwork. And Tate will, in time, collaborate with the institution that will be founded um, to be co-custodians for this work. All of this has required um, uh, an, an open heart and mind um, on the part of our trustees and changes to our ways of doing things. It's a shift of mind and heart and behavior and values. And it is this that has to underpin becoming a more inclusive institution. It seems to me this sort of work is critical in ensuring the relevance of museums in contemporary life. And I'm sure that many of my samples um, will be um, familiar territory for many of you. It's in shifting the daily practice of the museum rather than just doing special practices that I think uh, we can make most difference. And so I want to turn now to a uniquely um, Tate milestone project, the complete rehang of the collection of British art. For the first time in a generation, we would be able to showcase the growing diversity of our collection. So a very lengthy piece of organisational work has been undertaken and can now be seen within all of the collection galleries at Tate Britain. Of the 800 works on show, 70 um, uh, entered in the last five years alone. So the acquisitions are of our time. They extend our canon of modern, historic and um, um, contemporary British art. And we are now much a much better placed to be able to do justice to the significant contributions women artists have made, the artists of colour, that the international collections of British art have made um, um, since the late 17th century. It changes fundamentally the accepted narrative, narrative of British art in really major ways. What we wanted to do was uh, tell an account of British art within its historic context. We wanted to show that art was not made in a vacuum, um, but that uh, it speaks of the, the history and times that shaped it. Um, uh, I've got a slide has slipped, um, but no matter. Um, so for example, Jeremy Della, um, uh, um, has taken over um, a room which reflects the art of the Industrial Revolution, placing within it a two-faced clock um, uh, made for use in a factory where um, the, the work of labourers, um, um, the time um, that labourers spent, uh, was measured by a clock that also measured their output and labour. Um, in telling the history of the Industrial Revolution alongside the artworks that were produced during this time, we are taking an approach that assumes that the art of a given period is inseparable from the culture and society from which it has emerged. So the art on show tells stories of technology, politics, war, immigration, identity, as well as telling the story of aesthetic, art historical and creative brilliance. We don't any longer tell an island story, but room by room, the rehang travels the globe as it reflects the UK's interdependency and connection to a global story of transformation and change. Because for every British artist who has spent their time um, in Britain, there is one who was born somewhere elsewhere or whose identity was cross-cultural. And that is a tr as true of the earliest rooms in the Rehang, um, the um, immigrant artists who arrived in the 17th century, as it is of the final rooms of the, the contemporary displays. So this is a Rehang of our moment, 
telling big new stories about Britain and the world through our extraordinary collection. And it offers a history we hope to be more truthful and inclusive, one that we think a wider range of people will be able to see themselves in. You may wonder why I'm showing you a very traditional image of Thomas Gainsborough, the Bally family. But this work, long in our collection, um, gives a very good illustration of the shifts that we've made. Um, um, I want to share an example of how we wrote about this work before the rehang compared to one that you'll see on the walls that take Britain now. The original text read, group portraits by Gainsborough are relatively rare. This large example shows the London merchant James Bailey with his wife, Colin Campbell, their, and their four young children. Bailey's wife has been given the Christian name of her father, Colin Campbell of Glenur. Although a formal portrait, Gainsborough conveys the sense of an affectionate family. Mrs. Bally is seated roughly in the centre of the composition. Standing her youngest child on her knee, she appears to be the fulcrum of family life. <laughs> now, there's nothing much wrong with that caption. It's informative, straightforward, and gives a kind of matricentric reading to the composition, which illustrates the wider shift in the period in social values toward the domestic. But it also um, says nothing about a shared history that we think our visitors should be aware of. So the caption we now have says, this imposing portrait reflects Thomas Gainsborough's artistic ambitions and the social aspirations of the sitters. James Bally and his family present an elegant, affluent image of domestic harmony. This was underpinned by the wealth that Bally amassed through the Atlantic trade and plantations in uh, Grenada and British Guiana, labored by enslaved people. At his death, he left his son, Alexander, the boy in blue in the picture, the Grenada sugar plantation, and left each child 10,000 pounds, worth about 1.1 million pounds today. Some of the children later claimed compensation following the Slavery Abolition Act in 1833. So it's still a straightforward um, uh, piece of text and gives people factual information about the work. Um, what it notes now is the basis of the sitter's wealth as part of the historical archaeology of the legacies of slave trading, which we feel as an institution itself founded on wealth from sugar manufacture, although never slave grown sugar, we must own and share with our visitors. So that's just one example of the kind of shifts that we've made. But we're also mindful that not everyone reads labels or wall texts. Some come to the gallery to look for a purely sensory experience. So the rehang has also tried to bring to life pertinent themes and ideas by introducing works of contemporary art into the historic galleries. These works are positioned to be in dialogue with the historic art they sit between. So in this room, again, the earliest period in Tate's collection, um, you find uh, um, this contemporary work, Exodus II by Mona Hatoum. It's placed in the middle of the room, a quiet and apparently simple work, a pair of suitcases joined by the long strands of human hair. Hatoum herself fled, fled Palestine in 1948, finding refuge in Lebanon, where 30 years later, she was once again forced into exile on the outbreak of the civil war. Unsurprisingly, therefore, her work evokes the intense emotions associated with abandoned homes and lives torn apart. And in this instance, the work serves as a powerful tool, paying homage to the contribution of migrant and refugee artists in Tudor Britain, it sits in the Tudor room, as well as um, artists in London today. If we journey now from um, this end of the rehang, um, the beginning, the earliest years, to the final room, uh, what you will find is contemporary art in all its diversity and richness. And um, here you can see work by Veronica Ryan and, and um, uh, uh, 
as, as well as many others gathered in this space. The room features um, UK art um, uh, made in recent years, and unsurprisingly, it depicts a succession of recent crises and ruptures. Works in the room reference the Brexit ref um, referendum, the COVID-19 pan pandemic, the cost of living crisis, the election of Donald Trump, Black Lives Matters, the Me Too movement, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and civil wars in Syria, Sudan, Yemen and Afghanistan. We should not be surprised that these are the topics that contemporary artists choose to address. Many of the works speak to Black British experiences and histories of migration. Several centre the lives of Black women. Um, Veronica Ryans um, absolutely does that here, as well as queer people of colour. Imagined together, alone, real, imagined, joyful and defiant. So here you find the youngest artist in Tate's collection, Rennie Matic, a series of photographs made um, when they were 26. It's an interrogation of 21st century life as a queer non-binary person of color um, with, from mixed heritage. This work sits alongside a brilliant large scale canvas by Rachel Jones, one of a new generation of abstract painters who completed her fine art degree in 2019. You can see um, some of the detail of this brilliant work here. Sharing what it meant for her to be featured in this rehang, Rachel says, the representation of black female artists such as myself is vital to painting a full picture of humanity. When an organization is only reflective of one type of person or group, there's all this loss in terms of the conversations that can be generated and the way people understand their place within history. What excites me is that Tate Britain as a space will be representative of the world we inhabit. It's funny to it's such an exciting and brilliant artist articulates so meaningfully what we have been working so hard to achieve. The rehang is of course a reflection of Tate's central purpose, which is to promote the enjoyment of British and international art. Uh, and it puts at its center artists like Rachel in their own experimental rule breaking glory. What I think the rehang does is speak to the role museums serve in the 21st century. It needs to be spaces where different ideas are brought together where debate and differences of opinion are not only tolerated, but encouraged. And this rehang has triggered debate. You'll perhaps not be surprised to hear that we had uh, some barbed responses from certain corners of the UK media. The Daily Telegraph, for example, accused us of presenting a history underpinned by an exculpatory desire to distance ourselves from our imperial past which is funny because we thought we were doing the very opposite, striving for proximity rather than distance. The rooms in the rehang hold multiple truths, just as they hold multiple histories. And some of these truths may be those that people wish to turn away from, and that's their right. But they are truths that also may speak to a wider lived experience who those have um, who have for, of people who have in the past felt unacknowledged. By bringing together a wider range of perspectives and a richer tapestry of artists, we invite and speak to a wider range of people and views. This, we believe, will lead to new and different audiences, more reflective of the world we're in. We know that what Tate chooses to share with its public directly influences museum thinking around the world, something I see as both a responsibility and a privilege. I see this rehang as being in dialogue with the work of other great museums across Australia, Scandinavia, the African continent and Latin America, all evolving a richer and more inclusive view of who, who museums can speak to. In a time of ever greater polarization and politicization of culture, despite what some members of the media might love to pro proclaim alternative and expansive approaches to art and art history. Don't shy away from the difficult issues our history presents us with. 
They also don't tell us what to think. What they do is arm our public, I hope, with the knowledge to forge their own ideas and offer a deeper, deeper picture of our uni unique, dynamic visual heritage. And at that point, I will pause um, and to hear from you with any questions. Thank you, Maria. That's, uh... Amazing and complex variety of transformations. Uh, we don't have a role in mind today, so we those of you who continue to be happy to come to that. Anybody who could say? Before they formulate the question, oh, sorry, 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 Maria, can you hear me? I can hear you now. There was a terrible echo for a moment, but that seems to have been fixed. Thank Sorry, you. everyone. Yeah, we have uh, Dr. Pants and Gilbert trying to connect us <laughs> and deal with technology. <laughs> uh, Maria, thank you so much. That's exactly what we needed to hear. The contemporaries, but at the same time, the non binary between the traditional and the contemporary. The old English saying, once a practice, twice a tradition, uh, is repeated again and again in Australia. Uh, anyone with questions, please come to the front. We still have time. And uh, before the formulated questions that come to the front, if you, if you wouldn't mind, as a chair, I have a couple of questions. So one of the things that comes up in Australia is, what about British diaspora? Why is diaspora always part in terms of us and them in terms of uh, white British versus other Chinese, <coughs> Indian, and so on? So how do you deal with British diaspora we are so used to dealing with other diasporas. The second question is uh, one of the things that absolutely fascinates a lot of us and which is learning for us is the way you deal with indigenous uh, internationally. So, to what extent are you able to engage with the indigenous in India, which has uh, nearly 110 million tribal indigenous people? And uh, uh, having spent 40 days in Australia, but now working in India, it's a total contradiction how Australia has evolved and how India has yet to evolve in the representation of the indigenous South. So those are two questions coming, and there are people in the room. But would you like to answer those first? Um, I I will try, but um, I, I I was really struggling to hear you. Can you get? The first one, can you hear me now? That's better, yes. The first one is, how do you deal with the British diaspora? Because we used to be dealing with Chinese, Indian, Canadian diaspora in the musicological circles, but there is the British diaspora. A question that's coming up again and again in Australia. My second question is, it is fantastic how you're dealing with indigenous until we are. And uh, India is so much part of the British history. Mm. And how, how you deal with contemporary indigenous art from India? Yeah. Um, well, to, to answer the first question, I think um, it's uh, very well represented by my opening slide, uh, which was a work by the um, uh, British Punjabi uh, um, Scouse artist, uh, Shaila Berman. Um, she is part of a generation of artists who really um, uh, forged their work in the 1980s, definitely um, on the margins or um, on the outside of the art world, but very, very powerfully. Um, and, um, and she draws on um, um, her own parents' background, their journey to the UK, um, uh, the ice cream van that her father used to drive around uh, Merseyside featured us strongly in the work on the front of Tate Britain as 
did figures of Lakshmi and Shiva. And so her visual aesthetic and the way that she approaches um, um, British Asian history is deliberately uh, diasporic and, um, and deliberately about presenting a culture clash to us. And I think that it would be, I wouldn't, I would never want to put words in Shyla's mouth because she can speak very, very well for herself. But um, I think she would argue that um, uh, her um, British Asian perspective is both important and characteristic of life in Britain. And underpinning the rehang, um, there has been a determination not to imagine that there is a single um, story. Yeah. And that actually, as I said in my talk, from the very earliest stages, uh, artists were making their way to this country and helping to forge our national identity. Um, and so um, the um, the British Punjabi perspective of Shaila is um, as significant um, and influential as um, the um, the industrial revolution driven um, class perspective of an artist like Jeremy Della. And I feel that we are in a very um, uh, fortunate uh, point in history where those the multiple strands um, and plural narratives that constitute the actuality of Britishness are the subject of museums. And so what we just show by expanding those stories um, stands against a kind of right-wing, um, very nationalistic notion of Britishness, but it absolutely reflects the world that we really live in in this country. So for me, um, uh, well, I think the way our thinking is moving is to say these are British artists um, who happen to be diasporic, but they are forging Britishness um, um, actively and with us. And then... To move to your second question, um, it's interesting to draw on some work that happened before I came to Tate um, with the art Indian artist Nikhil Ch Chopra, who made a trilogy of works um, in Manchester, um, one with me at the Whitworth, um, another at the Museum of Science and Industry, um, and a final work which took place kind of across the city. And... Um, what he was exploring was the interconnectedness um, for Indian artists um, with British history. Um, and so is it the 19th century experience of um, uh, the uh, rule by the Raj um, was, it makes British history the subject um, uh, a, an appropriate subject for exploration for an Indian artist. Um, and so his performance at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester um, excavated the history of um, a locomotive, which had originally had been made in Newton La Willows in the north of England, had um, been shipped to India to serve on the Indian railways, had then moved people during partition to Pakistan, and then later in the 1970s had been given back to Manchester as a cultural diplomatic gift. I mean, that is an extraordinary history of an object, nearly all of which was lost, forgotten by the museum for many decades, but became um, active again through the performance that uh, Nikhil made uh, in the site and around that work. And I think that you scratch at almost any surface and what you find are complex intertwined his inter twined histories of power and um, movement between countries and between peoples and 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 sort of exploring that is what museums um, are in part for. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. I really appreciate your response. Okay, would you like to okay, well, okay. introduce your name and where you're from? Yeah. Hi, I'm Hilary Walter. I'm a manager of academic programs at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in Los Angeles, California. Um, thank you so much for your, your talk. It's very exciting, um, all the work that you're being able to accomplish at Tate. 
Um, my question is around the staff and how you were able to plan with your staff. Was there any pushback from your staff? Kind of interested in hearing a little bit more about the process of coming to the remake uh, in the British Palace. Thanks. Um, that's a wonderful um, question because one of the things that I often um, say is that in thinking more inclusively, we think about our program, we think about our and our program and our collection and all the work that we do. We think about our public, but we also have to think about our own people. Um, and if we ha aren't thinking in all in those three dimensions um, uh, constantly, um, we won't make significant progress. Um, I would say that um, the far from having pushback from staff about taking this approach, I think that what they might say is that they feel that um, uh, we as an institution haven't gone far enough. Um, and I'm OK with them saying that because I think their job as the thinkers and the researchers and the curators and the collections care staff that look after our objects I I want them to have the the energy to be challenging and reshaping how we think about our work. So um, an incredibly dedicated and um, large team of people worked on this project. Um, um, for some of them, uh, it meant rethinking and reworking um, how they approach their subjects. And for others, um, I think it was a moment where they felt they were finally given the space they wanted to be able to explore new ideas or bring new artists into the collection. And um, so uh, I think the the evolution of practice within our institutions, especially as younger generations of colleagues who have had a very different um, disciplinary and academic training um, as their energy comes into um, the institution and um, our job is to um, create the space where those different perspectives can um, be shared and thrive. And um, I mean, to a person, to be honest, with you, they will, were all fit to fall over by the time the rehang opened because rehanging a collection in it, in its entirety whilst staying open is the most extraordinarily difficult thing to do. But I think my um, my reading of how they, they've all had a summer holiday now and are feeling a little bit better. Um, but my my reading of the institutional mood, if you like, is um, um, they would um, they are pushing um, to um, do even more um, because um, they see this kind of work and thinking as the most dynamic aspect of um, museum practice. Thanks, Maria. Uh, my name is David Moskowitz, and I'm from the University of South Carolina in the United States. Um, I'm back. I was um, I, I was thinking about the rehang. I had a specific question regarding um, the description of the family painting and the ways in which uh, the focus moved away from a more straightforward description of what we were seeing to more of a context. And it made me think a few things. One was that in the original, there was a more um, natural, um, a more, more of a focus on the woman in the center of the painting as the mother and the, her, her role in the family. And then that shifted a little bit. Uh, that was one thing I was thinking about is if there was concern about try and keep that aspect since we often don't get um, you know a woman's perspective in those kinds of expository descriptions. And that kind of led to my other question, which was has there has there ever been discussion of um, I'm not I'm not even sure how to characterize it, like a short form and a long form of exposition. So there can be a more um, brief description, but then also something that provides more of that kind of context in an effort to be inclusive. Mm. I don't know, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Um, to address both, I mean, I think um, uh, I had 
appreciated in the the earlier the earlier version of the label isn't wrong the the point is that there is never a right label for a work there is the one that you write at a point in time that you hope gives some information um that can inform and um and aid the way that a visitor is looking at something so i appreciated the previous way we had written about it particularly because that was done at a time where there were very few other works that really did explore women's perspectives now one of the other things that's happened with the rehang is that we increased very significantly um the number of women artists in the early period we were able to acquire works um, that had not previously been part of the collection and let those women artists speak um, on those issues much more strongly. So there's a different context around the work um, and, a, you know, a real determination on the part of curators to demonstrate that whilst it was much more um, difficult to be a woman artist um, in the early period, there were nonetheless some very significant artists. Um, and there's a much larger exploration of gender and domestic dynamics across the whole rehang. So I think you still get that material. Um, what we hadn't ever done previously, um, or had only done in sort of very particular moments, was um, really ground the work in its broader social history. And that's the big change, really, in the rehang. What we had found from audience research was that um, so few people are taught that kind of history um, at school that the visitors were not um, equipped enough to be able to read the works um, usefully. And so we're not trying to tell people what to think. And we do try to keep the labels relatively short because a kind of text overload is a it can be a real problem. But um, we are trying to give them enough this happened then and these political or social issues were significant so that they can form their own judgments. And then to your question of longer uh, material, um, we're beginning to develop much more online so that there are QR codes where people can dive deep if they want to. Um, and um, and there is um, there are books about the rehang. So there are whole um, different themes and ideas that are explored in small books if people are interested. So a kind of layered approach to interpretation where it's um, a relatively short um, and um, and broadly um, historical um, factual label sits on the wall. And then there's the opportunity to um, to look much deeper for those who are interested. One last question. Hello, Maria. Um, my name is Dan Speaker. I'm from Australia. And actually, I was just at the Tate four days ago in uh, London, and now I'm here speaking to you in Vancouver. Wow. Um, I'm also on the National Council for Australian Museums and Galleries Association. So. My work looks at inclusion and access uh, of global museums and galleries. And I'm wondering, um, beyond the inclusion within your collection and your exhibitions, um, what the Tate is doing in terms of creating better access for diverse audiences and visitors. So whether you're looking at um, sensory maps and social stories, tactile, tactile modeling and interpretations, audio descriptions, so how are you making your collections um, and exhibitions accessible to diverse audiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it's a, a very important part of our work. Um, and so from, um, and, and there's a, a the, the kind of wide range that you would expect in terms of how we approach uh, these matters. So everything from um, having um, periods of time when exhibitions or displays um, will be, um, uh, m more relaxed and quieter so that um, uh, um, people and families um, in particular who have children with um, access needs can come um, and attend. And so we've, um, we have done research with particular um, visitor groups about what prevents or um, um, diminishes access to our work. And um, and we try to program that in. We have audio um, um, uh, guided tours um, and um, touch tours have long been part of um, the work that we do. 
Uh, we have an amazing group um, in Tate's and Ives who work across all of Cornwall, bringing people together because um, often distance and, and travel is one of the um, uh, issues in terms of access to the collection. We're using technologies where, while we can to augment and, and offer material in different ways um, so that um, it is um, uh, available for people, um, whatever their particular needs are. And I suppose sitting behind all of that, um, as well as the, um, um, the posts that we have within our visitor team and the thinking that goes on curatorially, we support a staff network um, who name themselves the um, DIS crossed out ability network who think through all the work that Tate does, whether it's for our own employees or for our visitors or our volunteers from the perspective of um, challenging the, um, the, the ableist presumptions that have sometimes underpin museums. So it's, um, as with our approach to all aspects of inclusion, um, we try to see embedded internally so that it can then deliver as it needs to externally. Thank you. But there's also always more to do. Um, um, uh, as you get feedback and you modify your practice. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I think your presentation is uh, very much you know, the heart, at the heart of the, this knowledge community. Since the beginning, we've taken the manifesto that how can the institution of the museum become more inclusive? Open yes. Not defining what is inclusion, but you know how can we become more inclusive? And I think your entire presentation was uh, a fantastic, inspirational uh, narrative for us within the spirit of this conference. Really appreciate your time, Maria. And would you join me in thanking Maria? Thank you. Thank you very much for the um, for the invitation, um, and it's lovely to connect to a group of people um, on another continent. I hope the rest of your um, um, conversations and presentations go really, really well. Thank you. Thank you very much.